morning, Dan. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good, good. Yeah, how's the talk preparation? It's good. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's honestly a little bit easier uh, to have the slides in front of you as opposed to speaking out to the crowd. Uh, I agree, yeah. Less multitasking, right? You can just focus on the computer and not... Look yeah, at yeah, exactly. So, um, I don't know how much more effective it is, but it's easier for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it'll be... Hopefully it'll be easy for me. This is my first online mini symposium, so I'll find yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, well, it went, it went well yesterday. <laughs> yeah, it was a good discussion. Morning, Peter. Good morning. Good morning, Peter. Yeah, Peter and I thought it went well yesterday, didn't we? It was quite a lot of interesting comments. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was really well attended too. Yeah. yeah um, I was very happy to hear the Japanese guys couldn't make it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess it's, uh, I guess it's, it would have been. It was 11 p.m. for them when it started. Yeah, okay. Well, not, not too bad, I guess, but not great either. <laughs> well, pretty extreme. Um, yeah, yeah. I guess I could have done 9 a.m. our time, which would have made it hard for Dan and a little bit easy for them. But anyway, yeah, I mean, time, I guess it worked out. You're going to be, uh, it's just going to be unfortunate for somebody, I guess. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> what? Yeah. This is why Australia always tends to, it tends to miss out because it, it's always out of sync with the rest of the world. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, more, hi, Emmett. Is that you, James? Yeah, that's me. Yeah. Uh, hey, hey, everyone. Good, good to have you. I can't see anyone. Is that correct? Yeah, um, it's probably me being in that. Well, I think actually most people only the the speaker can have a video. I think. Okay, I can't see. I can't even see. I just see some generic screen as the meeting topic and stuff. Is that what I'm supposed to be? Yeah, seeing? my video is blocked too at the moment. Okay. Okay, that's okay. I just wanted to make sure that I'm not totally messed up. <laughs> so. <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> Are you the second speaker, Amit? Yes, I am, uh, Peter. It's yeah. In place of Moshe. Okay, so do you have a different title or? Uh, I do have a different. Uh, yeah. Okay. It, I'm yeah, sorry. So the, the website. I have the old. I have the old uh, information from the web, from the conference webpage. Uh, okay. Should I forward it to you right now? Yeah, please do. Okay. Uh, yeah, I in in the email I updated everyone's titles. Oh, then I must have just found an old version of the email. So are you PJ, your PJ Thomas at Case? That's right. Yeah. Okay, he's on its way. Great. Okay, cool. So, James, do you want to transfer the host uh, to sure, me yeah. so, so that I, or actually, well, you're going to be the first speaker, so I guess you should stay. You should keep host. I'll just. I don't mind. Yeah, you're going to moderate, right? So you moderate. Yeah, I'll moderate. Um, and I guess I don't have to be. So can you turn on everyone's video? Okay, so recording. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Yeah. So welcome to the second uh, second session um, of the mini symposium on stochastic oscillators, and uh, we've got um, we've got James McLaurin going first, and then. Amit Bose from NGIT will go next, uh, then Dan Wilson, and then Shu Sen Pu will give the last talk. Yeah, so I'm just trying to get look at how to share this screen. Okay. Is that coming up correctly? Everyone can see my screen? Yes, looks good. Okay, okay great, yeah. So um, welcome everyone. I'm going to be talking about noise-induced oscillations in neural fields today. Oh, hang on, I've just got some emails. I might just answer some emails so people can join. Really sorry, it's going to go. Okay. Uh, right. So John Rinzel might be coming. Maybe you can email him, Peter. So anyway, I'm talking about noise-induced oscillations in neural fields. Okay. Okay, so um, just a few references I'll be referring to throughout. So I've got a new paper on the archive, Metastability Waves, Patterns and Oscillations. So this paper will give much more detail than what I'm talking about in my talk. I put up, I put up two days ago, so you should be able to find it on Google Scholar. I'm also drawing a work I've done with Paul Bresloff about wandering bumps in neural fields and earlier work with James Inglis a couple of years ago. Okay, so we've heard about all sorts of different oscillations in biology in the first session. Classically, most oscillators in biology 
um, if it's stochastic, you understand the stochasticity, the stochasticity to be a small perturbation on top of the oscillation. Okay, so I've written here in the, my first equation, typically, classically, the equation you would study is a finite dimensional system where without the noise, the system would oscillate anyway. Okay, and then the noise is just a small perturbation on top of the oscillation. Okay, so this is um, been studied a lot and we've used the developed phase reduction techniques, which we talked about yesterday, the isochronal phase reduction that gives it a sense of the stochastic phase of this oscillation. Okay, and the work that Pedro talked about yesterday kind of fits in this framework as well. Okay, so he talked about these jump Markov processes. Now, these systems often wouldn't oscillate if there wasn't noise, because if there wasn't any stochasticity, it would just stay in some state and not change at all. But in a certain sense, you can interpret it in the same framework because if you look at the limiting large system size limits, that wants to oscillate, and then you can understand the jump Markov process to be a perturbation about that. Anyway, so that's a, probably the most common type of oscillation. But what I want to, want to talk about today are systems where you need noise to oscillate. So the noise is fundamental and integral to the oscillation. Without the noise, you have no oscillation. Okay, um, so a well-known example of this in biology is stochastic resonance in excitable systems. Okay, so if you take an excitable system like the Hodgkin Huxley or Pitsu Nagumo, okay, so this, this is like a, this has a stable attractor, okay, but if the noise is big enough, you'll get outside of the basin of attraction, then you can induce these big um, excursions away from the stable, the fixed point. Okay, so in this case, noise can actually induce oscillations. That's a well-known example. Um, and I think Peter Thomas's work might fit in that category as well. So you might need oscillate noise to have an oscillation as well. I'm not sure. Okay, and a side aim of all my, of my work today is going to be to develop phase reduction techniques in an infinite dimensional setting. Okay, so just to explain my setting. Okay, so I'm starting with infinite dimensional deterministic equation. Okay, so it's gonna be like a neural field equation or a reaction diffusion equation. And I'm gonna assume there's a manifold of fixed points that's smooth. Now there's many examples that fit this setting. Okay, because very often if there's a pattern in a neural, in a infinite dimensional equation, you can apply an isometry to get another pattern. Okay, so for example, very often there's an invariance under translation. If your pattern's in like R squared, you can translate it and still have the solution. Or if someone, sometimes you can rotate it. Or sometimes you can apply other group transforms that will just uh, shift the pattern without changing its shape and that remains a solution. Okay, so it's very common that you have this smooth manifold of fixed points. So what I'm gonna to try to do is ask myself, suppose I um, apply noise, spatially extended noise to this system, how does that noise interact with this manifold of fixed points? And in particular, can the noise induce a slow oscillation on this manifold of fixed points? Okay. Okay, so I've got, my theory works in many contexts, but I'm gonna to talk today about um, neural fields. Okay, so neural fields, in particular, I'm going to talk about neural fields in the primary visual cortex. Okay, so our domain is numbers between minus pi and pi. Okay, so it, the domain is, uh, it represents the orientation preference of a population of neurons in a particular section of the visual cortex. Okay, uh, this, this model was originally developed by Hubel and Weasel, I think in the 60s. And in this model, there's preferential connections between neurons. So neurons with a similar orientation uh, preference are more likely to be connected than neurons with a, a more different orientation preference. Okay, so the equations take this form. So you have a basically a local decay given there by minus u theta of t. And then you have this integral um, that basically takes inputs from other parts of the, the brain and then filters it by F. And then you have this connectivity function, which will then explain how the relative effect of other neurons on the particular neurons with orientation selectivity theta. Okay, so just to be clear here, U is, it's, it's very much a macroscopic emergent variable. It's the average level of activity in a, in a section of neurons um, over a small in interval of time. Okay. Okay, so it's well known there's bump solutions to this. Okay, so these are just local, um, 
locally excited, excited solutions. In okay, case so you have a peaking activity at a particular orientation preference. Okay, now you can easily show also that if you have any one solution, you can translate it and you, that it will still remain a solution, okay, because there's complete invariance under rotation of our system in, this, in the dynamics I listed on this previous slide. Okay, I should be clear also, I'm going to force this by noise. Okay, so here I've got multiplicative noise B, a function of the, the neural activity multiplied by spatially extended noise. Again, because in neuroscience, the brain is typically very noisy, so you, you want to put some noise there and see how that affects the solution. Okay, now I previously talked about ways of simplifying and reducing these systems. Um, previously, I defined a variational phase. This is very much analogous to the phase of an oscillator. At this stage, of course, it's not oscillating, okay? So we're talking about a manifold of fixed points, okay? Not an oscillating system. Okay, so when I talk about phase, I'm talking about basically the nearest point on this manifold, okay? And it's not wanting to oscillate, but it is very analogous to phase reduction for oscillators. Okay, so the easiest way, the most natural and straightforward way to do it is just to define a variational phase. Okay, so what I'm saying is I'm taking, I'm taking the eigenvector of the adjoint operator. Okay, now just to be clear, we know there's always going to be zero eigenmodes, neutral eigenmodes. That's because of this translation invariance. Okay, so if I, because I can translate the solution and it'll remain a solution, that means that the derivative of that solution must be an eigenvector and it must have eigenvalue zero. Okay, so our system always has to have eigenvalue zero. And we're going to assume that aside from that, everything's stable. So all the other eigenvalues are taken to be strictly negative. Okay, now you don't have to stress out about essential spectrums and things because in fact, um, our operator here is bounded. Okay, okay so this integral operator is an operator on a Hilbert space, it's bounded. So everything behaves really well. You only have to stress out about essential spectra when you have Laplacians or derivatives. Okay, so, what that means basically is that once you know the spectra of this linear operator, you can say a lot about the stability of the system very easily. Okay, now just to be clear, the stability has been analyzed in great detail by Kilpatrick and Ermintraut. I'm drawing on their results from their 2013 paper. Okay, and what you can do is you can solve this implicit relationship insisting that your error term must be um, orthogonal to the eigenmode of the adjoint operator. Okay, so what this is basically saying we want we want the error term to be immediately decaying. It's got to be orthogonal to the eigenmode that wants to have eigenvalue zero. Okay, so it's the most natural way of choosing your coordinates to insist that your error term is going to decay uniformly. Okay, so if you do this, it turns out you can def you can then plug this into your stochastic equation, do your change of variable. Okay, then you get this SDE for the phase. Okay, so you get a lot of terms here, but the point is um, you can make sense of this up until a certain stopping time. Okay, um, I'll talk about this more soon. And what's good about this is you can then prove that your error term V, okay, so V is the difference between my solution and the nearest point on the manifold. Okay, so remember phi was my bump solution. B2 is saying translate my bump solution by the phase, B to T. Um, and I'm choosing that B in such a way to make this distance as small as basically very small. And then the benefit of this is what you find is that when you look at the dynamics for this error term, you find that to linear order, which is the dominant order, it wants to decay uniformly, okay? Because we've defined it to be such that it's orthogonal to the the kernel of the linear operator. Okay, so that means it's going to be decaying uniformly and that decay is going to dominate the error terms in the drift here. So you have, you have the square of the norm of the amplitude that's going to be dominated by the linear term when V is small and the epsilon squared term is going to be small. It's coming from the noise. Okay, so what this means is that you find that this, you get this really nice bound where the probability of the error term exceed, exceeding a threshold is really small. Okay, so we know basically what this means is that it's going to stay near this manifold for a very long period of time. So given we know this, the next most natural thing to ask is, given it's going to be near this manifold, 
what do we expect to happen? Okay, so it's going to be, the noise is still pushing it along this manifold, okay, because the, the direction is tangential to the manifold, still feel the noise. So in particular, we're going to ask ourselves, well, what if the noise correlation is, is such that we get oscillations? Okay, because we have a, we have a continuous manifold, so it's parameterized by S1. Okay, so it's possible that it can just keep pushing it on average in one direction and you get this very slow wandering of the bump in a particular direction over a very long period of time. So we're going to try to get a more precise mathematical expression for this. Okay, so the first thing, if we want to try to answer this question, the first thing we might want to do is to try to look at our phase SDE for the variational phase. Okay, now we immediately run into problems, okay, because if we just look at the relative order of magnitude of our terms, we see in my drift term here that I have an order of this square norm of the amplitude error. Now the problem with this is that typically this amplitude is magnitude of epsilon. Okay, so epsilon is the magnitude of the noise. So that means that the contribution of this amplitude term is roughly the same order as the other terms in the drift. And that makes it very hard for me to try to solve this. Okay, because I have to take into account both the amplitude and the phase to try to work out the distribution of the wandering. Okay, so the basic problem is I haven't separated the amplitude and the phase as optimally as I could have. Okay, so what I need to do is I need to find a slightly different phase that is very close to the original one, but is such that I get rid of this, these V squared terms in my drift. Okay, because now I, once I get rid of those, I can then um, look at the invariant distribution here in the bottom of this D gamma SDE and then work out the average distribution of the phase as it wanders around the manifold. Okay, so I, I define what I'm calling the isochronal phase. Um, again, we're not yet in an oscillator. So um, I'm just using the same word as oscillators because it's the most analogous thing I can think of. Um, so the isochronal phase, just like with oscillators, is saying, well, let's take my deterministic dynamics, let's run it to infinity. Okay, and assuming we're in the in base of attraction of our manifolds, let's define our um, let's define our isochronal phase to be the limiting value such that it'll converge to that, that point on the manifold. Okay, so it's very much analogous to the, the oscillator isochronal phase. Okay, so you immediately get this nice property, okay, because theta u must be invariant under the deterministic flow. Okay, so if I take my initial value u, if I advance it under the deterministic flow, the isochronal phase won't change by definition. So I get this, this product property here, the fresh derivative of my map has to be um, zero when you evaluate the rate of change of the flow. Okay, okay, so what this basically means is that, I should note also here that the difference between my isochronal phase and my variational phase is very small. Okay, so it's the order of the square of the amplitude. Okay, but the good thing about doing this, of course, is now I, I eliminate my order v squared terms from my drift. Okay, so what I get is, this is actually basically the same equation as Zara's equation yesterday when she talked about second order phase response curves. Okay, so you have your first order response is just this stochastic integral here. And then because we're looking at stochastic processes, okay, they fluctuate a lot. Okay, so Brownian motion isn't differentiable in time. So those tiny fluctuations mean you have to look at second derivatives in order to do the change of variable. So this is known as Ito's lemma. Okay, so when we do this change of variable, we get this other term here. Okay, so, okay, because we've, we've got, remember our, our noise is spatially extended. Okay, so it's infinite dimensional. Okay, so what you have to do is you have to take your Hilbert space, you have to take, what you can do is you can choose an orthonormal basis and then write your noise to be the sum of, um, of like individual Brownian motions multiplied by the amplitude of the noise multiplied by the basis vectors. Okay, so you can, you can decompose your noise just orthonormally using Hilbert space theory. Okay, so here the EJs, these are just my orthonormal basis, okay? And I'm assuming, that, I'm assuming this thing's gonna converge, okay? Because I should make this more clear at the start, but actually you need to assume that these Bs, these multiplicative operators, uh, their magnitude has got to go to zero, okay? And this has to be, this sum, summation has to converge because if it didn't, then your noise would not be spatially continuous, okay? And it wouldn't make any sense and you can't do anything. 
Okay, so you, you do need to assume some damping of the high order Fourier motors for the noise, otherwise it won't make sense. So anyway, so this thing's gonna make sense. And this drift term here looks horrible, but the point is it is, it's going to be reasonably regular. And what I can do is I can now approximate it. So I can, I know that for these long periods of time, my system is staying close to the manifold. So I can replace my U, the solution of my original system by the point on the manifold phi evaluated at the ice chronal phase. And I know that's gonna be a very good approximation because just from the, my definitions. Okay, so this is a good approximation in going from gamma to tilde gamma. Okay, I'm just replacing everything by, and the benefit of doing this now is that this equation for tilde gamma now is a self-contained equation without any u's. So what I've done is I've, to leading order, identified a leading order um, equation that doesn't depend on the amplitude vector. Okay, and now I'm gonna analyze this uh, equation for tilde gamma and use that to work out the long time distribution of the phase as it wanders around this, this manifold. Okay, now the easiest way to analyze this is to do a rescaling of time. Okay, so you'll see here that in my tilde gamma equation, I have epsilon squared in front of the drift and epsilon in front of the noise. Turns out if I rescale time by epsilon squared, then I get rid of these epsilons. So I, I should be clear this, this new process here, it has the same law. Okay, so I'm talking, oh, what I'm trying to do is understand the probability law of the process. Okay, and as is, now I can just use conventional SDE theory because this is now a one dimensional SDE on S1, our ring. Okay, so I can just, this is, it looks complicated, but it's just, it's just one dimensional SDE theory. Okay, so I can study this. I can use, use, just use standard theory to look at the invariant distribution. Okay, so I'm going to write down here my Fokker Planck equation. Okay, I'm assuming my, my noise um, magnitude is strictly greater than zero, so I don't get anything pathological happening. Okay, now I can look at this Fokker Planck. This is how the probability law evolves in time for a one dimensional SDE. Now, because everything's continuous, standard theory dictates that this thing is going to converge to its, its limiting distribution, okay? So what I mean by that is, if you have a stochastic process on a compact domain, okay, everything's, all the coefficients are continuous, then as t goes to infinity, the probability distribution of your process has to go towards a limiting distribution. This is the invariant distribution or the invariant measure. So I'm writing here the invariant measure is p star, so, you work out what that is just by setting dp dt to be zero in this equation. Okay, so this doing that, I get my equation for my invariant measure, and I can just solve this using first year calculus. Okay, it's just single variable differential equation. Okay, so I can solve that easily, and uh, this will give me my solution for the invariant distribution for this rescaled process. Okay, so this is what basically gets me to my first results. So well, I, I can now say that if I take any t continuously differentiable function, I look at its empirical average. Okay, so here I'm saying take my function, take my phase as it wanders over the manifold, and then take the average of the function evaluated at that phase from time zero to time t. So this is like the what you would expect on average to observe for the wandering of the phase. And what we find is that this average converges just to the average with respect to the invariant distribution. Okay, this is what you probably would expect. And you can show the probability of exceeding some threshold is very small. Okay, so we know that it's gonna be nice and close. So this is gonna be a very nice, good solution. Okay, so this is the first thing. So we know the expected distribution of, of my phase. The next thing we're gonna ask, this is the whole point of the talk, is does it oscillate on average? is it biased to head in one direction over very long periods of time? Okay, and the answer is yes, under many conditions. So what we want to do is we want to go back to the fact that, I'll just go back a slide. So we have this SDE here, gamma tilde, which approximates from my original. Okay, now all I want to do is I want to take one over T times gamma T in this expression, okay? So you can see immediately that my starting condition, beta, one over t times that is gonna to go to zero, obviously. Now I have a stochastic term here, one over t times a stochastic integral almost always goes to zero, okay? Because stochastic integral is typical scale and magnitude is order square root t. So now that's gonna to go to zero. So I see immediately that one over t, gamma tilde t, is, is gonna be dominated. The only term left is this term. 
So I just have to look at one over T times this, and that'll give me my average um, uh, bias in the phase in one particular direction over long periods of time. Okay, so I'm just gonna evaluate one over T times that drift term, that's what I get here. So I'm doing, okay, so one over T times that, as I said, the stochastic term is negligible. Okay, and then assuming this function here is, okay, so this is ultimately just a function of my phase. As long as this phase, this function, is twice continuously differentiable, then I can apply the result just on here, okay? Because this is for any twice continuously differentiable function. So I substitute g equals this horrible looking function, uh, then I know that this must be with a high degree of probability very close to just the expectation with respect to the invariant measure. Okay, so basically I know that if this number is non-zero, there's going to be an average bias in the phase wandering over long periods of time. So if this is positive, the phase is going to be biased to wander to the, to the right. If it's negative, the phase is going to be biased to wander to the left. And it's only a very, very weak bias, okay? Because this is scaling as epsilon squared. So you'd only see, if you're epsilon small, then you're only going to see this over very long periods of time. So it's only a very weak average bias. Okay, so first example, I'm just going to force this by almost white noise. As I was saying, I can't have purely spatially white noise because then you wouldn't have a continuous solution and it wouldn't make any sense. Um, but so basically, as you might expect, if the noise is almost white, it's not really biased to go in any direction, okay, because it's filling, it's filling the same stimulus everywhere, roughly. Okay, so as you expect, the invariant measure is just flat. It's as likely to be at any angle as any other angle. Um, diffusivity is constant, okay, and the correlation Q here is, is very much concentrated on the diagonal, okay. Now, I just played around with this. I don't have as many results as I'd like, but if you, if you play around with more exotic correlation functions, and there is good, good motivation for that because you have all sorts of unknown correlations in, in noise in the brain, it's, there's a lot of unknowns. So if you play around with some more exotic correlation structures, so here I've actually introduced anti-correlation, okay? So you see my correlation matrix here. Um, it's always gonna be positive on the diagonal, but there's anti-correlation with phase shifts. So that's negative there, okay? So if you do that, it turns out you get more exotic invariant measures that can concentrate at different locations, okay? And I haven't put it up, but in this case, you do find that there is an average bias of the phase wandering, okay? Because the expectation of that, the function on the previous slide is non-zero. Okay, so basically what I've illustrated is that this is a different mechanism for getting oscillations. Okay, so we've got a system where it doesn't want to oscillate without noise. You need the noise to oscillate and you get an oscillation because the noise introduces a weak bias in particular directions along my manifold. So you're only going to see this by taking looking at averages over very long periods of time. We've identified the average shift of this manifold of the solution over long periods of time. Okay, it's, it's a, a local theory. Okay, I don't need to know anything about what happens away from the basin of attraction of my manifold of bump solutions, okay? So what I want to do in the future is apply this to phase decomposition of oscillations and PDEs. So Nick Howe's done a bit of work on this and a few other people, but generally phase de decomposition of oscillations and PDEs is very underdeveloped, partly because it probably is gonna be quite hard, but I think it's still an interesting and important application of the theory. Great, so that's it. Um, I welcome your questions. Okay, thank you, James, for a very interesting talk. Um, if anybody has got questions, either from the panelists or the participants, you can unmute yourself and ask, or you can put them into the chat, and or you can raise your hand through Zoom. Uh, so while people try to sort that out, I'll ask a first question. Um, so some of the neural field models that you talked about at the beginning as motivation are related to uh, Cowan's work on hallucinations. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if one of the consequences of your results would be that you would expect, uh, say, geometric visual hallucinations that spontaneously rotate in one direction or another. Yeah, we should say Cowan and Thomas's work on hallucinations, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Breslov and a lot of other people. Yeah. Um, yes. So I'd like to do that because that's obviously a much more exotic 
because you have, you have you have a three dimensional invariance, right? You have shift twist, is it? I forget. You have you have multiple. Yeah, there are there are interesting symmetries related to the anatomy, but uh, yes, uh, you would. Yeah, yeah, because you could have you could have multi mixed mode oscillations because you'd have you'd have biases in each according to each mode, or some of them, or none of them, or depending how you set up the noise. So yeah, you you definitely could see biases and drift average drifting of the phase over long periods of time. That's right. I want to do that actually. I'm planning to uh, do that hopefully over the summer with my student. Yeah, it's a very cool paper. Yeah, that would be that would lead to some visually arresting uh, um, patterns you might you might get. Yeah, that's very right. interesting. Are there questions from uh, any of the other participants? So I'll ask another question. Um, uh, you're the, this, the manifold that you stay close to, um, uh, it's always compact in your, in your setup? Um, it doesn't have to be. So um, that's a good point. So this works for like traveling waves. Okay, so if you shift a traveling wave, you can do any shift, okay? And then it'll still be a traveling wave. So that's an example where the manifold isn't compact. Um, I just, I need the compact manifold just to talk about oscillations because you, you need to be able to go in one direction and come back to where you were, so to speak. Right. Well, so the stationary, if you're going to have a stationary measure, um, that's more problematic if you, uh, if, if you have a non-compact manifold, right? Exactly. You can go off and keep going and never come back. That's exactly right. Yeah. It is, I mean, that's something I'd like to look at as well, invariance of like traveling waves under noise as well and see, see if you can identify this invariant measure. Yeah. Okay. Kyle, uh, Kyle's got his, Hand up, you wanna, um, can you unmute yourself and I think you might ask have to do a question? It. You might have to do it, Peter. Um, do I have do to I unmute him? Am I the host? You're the host, so I think you might have to. Uh, uh, work this out. Uh, yes, Kyle. Okay, yeah, Kyle needs one of us to unmute him. Okay, so Kyle should be unmuted. Hello? Hello? Oh, you can hear me. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for that really, really fascinating talk, James. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to, maybe you mentioned this already at the beginning, and I, and I, I just missed something in the assumptions, but is there anything that you could say about what happens when there are like weak anisotropies in your coupling function J? So I know that, you know, Zach and Paul had this paper about these trapping regions uh, where you make sort of the coupling heterogeneous. And I wondered uh, whether, you know, you can find situations in which you still get this wandering even in, in, in when you have these weak anisotropies. It's a very interesting question. It's actually one I'm looking at at the moment in some of my research. Um, it's very interesting, and I think you could. I think it's 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 pretty hard. Okay. Often, when you have this static disorder in systems, um, it can get very hard to analyze. Um, depends how you set up the static disorder, but I, you're basically right. I think you would. So you, you could get. I mean, if your if your disorder was great enough to like destabilize. As you said, it can in introduce a weak bias in one direction and destabilize the linear operator. Then, sure, I, I think you're right. I think it's a great question. I think it would happen. Um, I think is it, maybe even you have a paper on this, do you? I think Steve Coombs has a paper on this, maybe. So, uh, I don't think we have anything that precisely on that question, but it was we were sort of leading in that direction a little bit with respect to some of the grid cell work. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. It's a very interesting question. Um, it's something I want to do. It's. Um, I, I personally find it very hard because actually white noise, it, it might seem more complicated. It's actually easier because it keeps, it's like my coving, so it forgets about its history. So it actually makes it easier to analyze in some ways. Um, static disorder, you can have all sorts of weird things happen and you have to keep track of where it was before and it's more tricky. Yeah, no, absolutely. A lot, lot harder. But, yeah, but okay. the rest of the thing, yeah. Uh, it's 10.30 now. I, I think we will do as we did yesterday, which is to have an open discussion at the end of the last talk. Um, so, so the discussion about uh, James's uh, presentation can continue then. Yeah. But uh, now I'd like to ask James to um, make Amit the host so that uh, Amit can, can take over and give his talk. Okay, I'll do that. I'm just trying to work out how to do this. Uh, And okay, Amit should be Amit should be the host now. Yeah.
Yep. Okay, yep. welcome. So Amit's going to tell us about dynamics of hierarchical circadian systems. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Make sure that everything is good. Can you guys see my cursor as well? Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay, great. So first of all, thanks to um, James and Peter for organizing and giving me a chance to speak. Um, my topic is a, not stochastic, so I'm a, kind of a fill-in, so I hope you don't mind. But there is some ideas that are similar to the th many great talks that we heard yesterday, as well as this morning in terms of phase reduction and thinking about uh, isochrons and things like that, although we explicitly don't use them, as I'll show you later on today. But um, this work that I'm going to present to you is basically uh, part of my PhD student, Guang Yuan Liao's thesis work. He's finishing his uh, dissertation this summer, and then he's going to move on to a uh, postdoc at KAIST in South Korea. And it's also joint work with uh, Casey Diekman, where basically Guang Yuan has taken some of the work that Casey and I had started a few years ago and has extended that. So uh, the other thing I just want to do is some bookkeeping. I, I live on a very noisy road, so you might hear some background noise, uh, trucks and things going by. And if you can't hear me well, then Peter, just let me know, okay? Will do. So um, I want to talk about the circadian rhythm, which I think many people are probably generically familiar with. It's basically an internal rhythm that regulates many of our uh, daily processes, including sleep-wake, digestion, hormone release. And um, the thing that I would like you to focus on is the fact that circadian systems have the ability to be entrained by the light-dark cycle. So in this picture, in this schematic, the idea is that within our brains, we have these uh, cells or neurons that are sensitive to the intensity of light. And they basically begin to and get entrained to a 24-hour light-dark signal. So these are in an area of our brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Now, these neurons, once they entrain to the 24-hour cycle, they're sending information to other parts of the body. So down here, I've labeled this as the peripheral parts of the body. And so let's, for example, your kidneys or your digestive system, those also have circadian oscillations on a 24-hour cycle, but they're entrained not by the direct light-dark forcing, but instead by the information that they receive from the central oscillator. Okay, so that's, that's called a hierarchical system. So let me show you a schematic of this from a paper uh, from 2006, Journal of Biological Rhythms. Lysen Siegelman, just please focus on the left-hand panel for a second. So over here, imagine that you've had many, many days of exactly the same light-dark cycle. So this is a typically 12 hours of light followed by 12 hours of darkness. And this input is going into the master pacemaker, which I had early, earlier called the central um, um, oscillator. And then that's sending information to these other peripheral oscillators. Here, there's an intermediate component, but there's peripheral components one, two, three, and four. And what we try to understand in these situations is if you started with an entrained solution, so if you started uh, here with the first two days and everybody entrained to 24 hours, and then you suddenly shift the phasing of the lights. So again, imagine all of us have gone through jet lag. Uh, I guess nobody's done it recently given the pandemic, but uh, we all understand that there are effects due to jet lag, and that's basically an instantaneous change of the light-dark phasing. And then the question is, how do these oscillators re-entrain re to the new light-dark cycle? So on the right panel, I'd like you to just focus uh, for the time being on the purple arrow. The purple arrow and the triangles are the phases of the central oscillator or the master pacemaker. So at day zero, you're fully entrained, and then in this example, the lights are shifted in a particular manner. You can, I'll just let you view it. And then you can see that the central oscillator, if you follow my cursor, entrains fairly quickly, but it does so in a, in a specific manner, okay? Now, one of the, the peripheral oscillators, if you look at the green arrow in this example, it starts, that peripheral oscillator starts at this phase, and then it um, goes and it, it wanders around, and it takes a long time before it eventually comes to its stable phase, okay? So this is an example of shifting the lights in one particular manner. If you look at panels B and C, and for example, just focus on the central oscillator, the central oscillator in this case, basically very quickly entrains by phase advancing 
Whereas in this case, in the previous example, it phased advanced and then it phased delayed. So the main point of these kinds of um, simulations is to show that in these systems, these hierarchical systems, the way that oscillators in train can differ from phase advanced to phase delay, depending on how the lights are shifted. And they can also take a longer time in this example, the entrainment time before all the, the system is fully entrained is much longer compared to the rightmost panel where the things entrain quite quickly. Okay, so what we set out to do is to try to understand this idea from a mathematical perspective. So we want to determine uh, the entrainment properties of central and peripheral oscillators differ in hierarchical systems. Uh, we'd like to do some analysis and some computation. And um, we'd like to ultimately identify um, mathematical structures that will help us explain why in that previous example, uh, let me go back, in that previous example, you might have phase advance followed by phase delay, or you might simply have phase advance. So are there mathematical structures that kind of tell you that this kind of behavior is likely to be present in the system? Okay, so a very quick uh, slide here to show that there's many, many examples of this kind of mathematical study, basically phase locking due to periodic forcing. And I apologize to the many experts on the, both on the panel as well as who are participants in this. This is a very, very you know, narrow group of people I've just pulled out. And there's so many more papers that I could have put here, but I just grabbed these for a second. The, the top set of papers are mostly mathematical papers. The next set, circadian literature. The, uh, the main groups to look at are Cronauer's group. Uh, actually, the names that I've listed here. And then I think many of you are familiar with the fact that when you have these periodically forced systems, you end up with these different phase locking regimes, which are often characterized by trying to understand the Arnold tongue structure. And sometimes that leads to the devil's staircase and uh, serious theorem, mathematical theorems about circle maps. I'm not gonna discuss any of these things, but I just wanna point out that those are all in the background of the kinds of research that we're looking at. Okay, one other thing before I get to the model that we're thinking about. And this is kind of an interesting fact about circadian oscillators. So a circadian oscillator has to have the ability, the endogenous ability to have a roughly 24 hour limit cycle or periodic orbit, either in constant darkness or in constant light. Okay, so they, these oscillators need to be endogenous oscillators. They don't need input in order for them to oscillate. But when they do get this LD input, so my, my labeling will be DD for dark, dark, always dark, this is in constant light, and LD will mean some amount of light, typically 12 hours, and then some amount of darkness, again, 12 hours. So in the presence of LD forcing, it was way back in the 80s that Peterson noted that the solution that you're likely to find is going to be bouncing back and forth between the DD oscillator and the LL oscillator. So these are two different limit cycles in two different locations of phase space, and your actual solution of interest is going to be chasing the DD oscillator during the dark period and the LL oscillator during the light period. But what I'll note is that these DD and LL oscillators have very different attractive structures. They need not be the same. And in particular, they have different isochrons. Now, you know, we spent a lot of time listening yesterday to talks about isochrons. The other thing I'm gonna mention is that there's no reason to believe a priori that the uh, nature of the manifolds of either of these oscillation or oscillators is the same. And certainly these manifolds of LL and D are not invariant once you go to the periodically forced flow. So you can't really rely on the information solely from LL and DD uh, because that information is just transient information. But it turns out that it's useful information. It helps guide how trajectories move in phase space. So what we're going to use in this talk is uh, the entrainment map that uh, Casey Diekman and I developed. And we're going to use it on the, uh, a very old and basic model, the Novak Tyson model for circadian oscillations. M here, sorry, P is the concentration of a protein. M is the concentration of, M of uh, MR mRNA. Uh, I'll, I don't want you to focus too much on the equations. I'll show you some null lines on the next slide. But I do want you to note that f of t is just a heavy side function. It's either zero or one, depending on whether the lights are on or off. So when f is equal to zero, the lights are off. You have a planar system. When f is, the lights are on, f is gonna be equal to one. You have a different planar system. And we're gonna follow the trajectory as it moves between these two different phase spaces. Okay, so 
when we do that, on the right-hand panel, I'm showing you in this phase space a projected uh, uh, solutions of both the light light limit cycle, which is the dashed red. You can see it here, and then it gets overlaid. The dark dark limit cycle, which is this portion. These are projected onto the common MP phase plane. And then the periodically forced solution, which we call the LD solution, in which the trajectory actually, if you start up here when the lights are off, it tracks the DD solution for some time. As soon as the lights turn off, it's now trying to find the light solution. So it leaves the dark, dark solution, and then it goes like this until it comes to the attracting left branch, passes this punk ray section, which will be relevant for us, and then continues on its way. So this is, this is an example of what Peterson was saying, that you go between light and dark. Now, in this example, we put a punk ray section on the left branch because we knew that all trajectories would have to pass through it. And what we did is we started with an initial condition of the oscillator on that punk ray section, and we varied the phasing of the lights. So the phasing of the lights, as you'll notice here, is, is easy to note. This is phase equals one hour of lights on, two hours of lights on, et cetera. So that it, at this portion, the lights have been on for 10.2 hours. And then what we did is we varied that phasing and let the trajectory flow in phase space until it returned to the Poincaré section and we measure the new phasing of light. And that's how we determine this, this uh, 1D entrainment map. And the map is defined simply by calculating the return time for the trajectory from the Poincaré section back to itself or different phasings of the initial light dark cycle. And what you can see is that this map is a very beautiful piecewise continuous map, okay? It has two fixed points. One fixed point occurs exactly at 10.2, which is the stable LD entrained solution. And then there's another fixed point, which is not obvious from the simulation alone, but is obvious from, it becomes obvious when you look at the map. This is an unstable fixed point at around um, X equals 21. And that's actually acting like a separatrix for trajectories that converge to the stable fixed point via phase advance or via phase delay, okay? So this all, already gives you uh, some insight into the Siegelman and Lice, or Lice and Siegelman result that I showed you earlier on, that there may be a structure in the phase space that's separating phase advance from phase delay. And it turns out to be an unstable fixed point of this 1D entrainment map, okay? Okay, so now for the work that Guang Yuan um, my PhD student worked on was to take two copies of this Novak Tyson model. So the first copy that you see above is exactly the same one that I presented in the previous slide. And then he amended to it a second copy of um, the Novak Tyson model, but now he's coupled the two through this so-called hierarchical structure. And you can see that the second equation, M2 equation, receives a continuous forcing from the first M1 equation. And there's a biological reason for why we place the coupling there, which I won't go into. But what I want to point out to you at this point is that we really now have a five-dimensional phase space. Obviously, you see the four dimensions associated with the four variables, but you also have the light-dark forcing. So you have one dimension uh, associated for when the lights are on or off, okay? So you have a five-dimensional phase space. And what we're trying to do in the and what he did actually was to reduce this five-dimensional phase space to the two-dimensional entrainment map, okay? So this is, this is gonna be an extension of the work that Casey and I did. So let me try to walk you through this now. Okay. Um, any questions thus far? I know it's kind of awkward to ask questions, but um, if not, I'll keep going. Okay, is the sound okay, Peter? So far, so good. Okay, Carry okay. on. Great. Okay. So the first thing that Guang Yuan did is he said, okay, what if, I'm sorry, let me go back to the system one more time. He said, well, what if you just assume that this pair of oscillators is already entrained? So in other words, suppose the first oscillator is already entrained to the forcing of the light dark cycle. Now, can we understand how the peripheral oscillator in this case will entrain given that the first oscillator is already entrained? And so that leads to what we call the one-dimensional O1 entrained map. And it's very, very similar to the 1D entrainment map that I showed you earlier, except now what you have to keep in mind is that there are two limit cycles of interest. So in the 
panel that I have my cursor over, you see that solid line one is the order is the O1 oscillator that's already entrained with our markings. So this is where the lights turn on one hour, two hours. And then the dashed one is the entrained solution for this NT2, for the second oscillator, okay? And what we did here is again, we've marked the hourly markings. And now what we're gonna do is instead of putting the Poincare section, originally it was on the left branch of the oscillator one, we're putting the Poincare section on in the phase space of the second oscillator, okay? And the reason that we want to do this is we want to measure everything with respect to the second oscillator. So we wanna measure the phase of lights with respect to the second oscillator. And we wanna measure the phase of the first oscillator whenever the second oscillator is sitting at that Poincare section, okay? So um, the Poincare section is, is totally different in phase space. We have a five dimensional system, but in this 1D01 entrained map, we've been, we're gonna reduce it back to one, uh, a one dimensional map. And you see the definition is similar. I, I hadn't really gone through the definition before, but the structure of the map is very similar. You have one stable fixed point, one unstable fixed point, that acts as a separatrix, dividing solutions that entrain via phase advance versus via phase delay. And what you see here is just a simulation of the result uh, confirming that solutions do entrain. The black is the entrained solution by either phase advance or phase delay, okay? So when the first oscillator is already entrained, nothing really new happens. You get what you expect to get. It's when the first oscillator is not entrained that things become more interesting. So uh, this is just to show you that if you vary parameters, you can lose solutions through saddle node bifurcations. I'm gonna skip over that. And now let me get to the real meat of what we wanna talk about. It's the 2D entrainment map. As I mentioned before, we start with a five dimensional phase space. As soon as we put the Poincare section in there, we reduce it by one dimension to four dimensions. There's a mathematical reason why trajectories for the second oscillator actually get funneled into a very small neighborhood of this point. So using that, that reduces the dimension even one more to three dimensions. And so what we have now is instead of a five dimensional system, we have a three dimensional system. We're gonna come up with a way to reduce it to even one more dimension, okay? So one of the dimensions that we have to keep is the phase of light, but the other dimension is the phase of the second, uh, sorry, of the first oscillator. We want to know where is the first oscillator in phase space whenever the second oscillator is sitting on the Poincare section. And the thing that we need to keep in mind is that when oscillator one is not entrained, it doesn't need to live on its limit cycle. It could be traveling anywhere in phase space, okay? So a perturbation, a shift of the light dark cycle will move both oscillator two off of this dashed limit cycle, and it will move oscillator one off of its limit cycle from wherever it started. All right, so that's a problem because that actually leads to uh, some ambiguity of the position of oscillator one when oscillator two returns to the Poincare section. So what we do is we do a phase reduction method, which is built on many ideas that Guang Yuan got from many of the speakers in this panel, including Dan Wilson, who's gonna speak next. What he did is he basically said for oscillator one, he's going to define the phase of any point in the phase space of oscillator one based on basically moving the um, coordinate system to some location, starting with an initial value of the phase, phase equals zero is somewhere over here, and then allowing the trajectory to move anywhere it wants in phase space until oscillator two returns to its Poincare section, and then measure the new phase of oscillator one by projecting its current location back onto its limit cycle. Okay, so that's just a way of saying that wherever oscillator one ends up, project it to the appropriate location on the limit cycle that is, has a well-defined phase, and that's what this argument is. This defines a two-dimensional map. So the two-dimensional map has two pieces. It has a piece which tells you what the new value of the phase of the first oscillator is, and the second piece is the value of the light phasing, which is uh, coming from the light-dark forcing, okay? So now we have this two-dimensional map. It's a little bit complicated. How do we analyze such a thing? What I want you to just think about is now geometry. This is a, pi one is a function of two variables. Pi two is a function of two variables. We can graph those functions. Literally, we graph those functions as surfaces in the appropriate phase space. And then we project intersection of each of those two dimensional graphs 
with the generalization of the diagonal from a one-dimensional map. The gen generalization of a diagonal from a one-dimensional map is a two-dimensional plane. It's a diagonal plane. And so we intersect the surfaces pi one with an appropriate plane, the surface pi two with an appropriate plane. And the purple here is every point in the xy domain for which the surface lies above the diagonal. The gray is for where every point lies, the surface lies below the diagonal. This is where the surfaces intersect. And these white lines that you see are points of discontinuity of the map, okay? Similarly, in the red over here is for the second portion of the map, pi two. And now what you see in this right panel where my cursor is now are these so-called null lines projected onto the same place. And wherever these purple and red curves intersect, you have fixed points, okay? You have fixed points of your map. So in this particular example, you end up with four fixed points, A, B, C, and D. And before you had any idea of this map, you would have no notion of, no real reason to believe that there should be anything but a stable and trained solution. Now we see that there's actually four fixed points and we actually have a proof uh, or an indication in a different model that we're working on why four is an upper bound. What we did then is we started, we first linearized around these fixed points to figure out what their stability is. But this is, this is the beautiful picture that I'd like you to think about a little bit. What he found was that A is the stable and trained solution, this fixed point. But points C and B are saddle fixed points of the map. And if you look here, what we did is he took every initial condition in this plane and measured how long it took for that initial condition to iterate until it converged to this fixed point where my cursor is, point A. And what you notice is that there are these light green structures that emerge. And these light green structures correspond to very, very long entrainment time, okay? It turns out that these structures corresponding to very long entrainment times are basically the stable manifolds of the saddle point C and the saddle point B. And over here down below, these are the strong and weak stable manifolds of the point D, which is an unstable source, okay? And then, uh, let me go, so, so basically the entrainment time calculations, how long does it take for iterates to reach this fixed point, reveals the existence of these manifolds. And if you follow iterate structure, taking any point in the plane, and then iterating it and plotting those iterates for 10 points, you see things very strongly converge to this point A. They diverge in a very saddle-like manner from this point C and from this point B. And from the source in the lower right-hand corner, they all uh, emanate, okay? Here, Guang Yuan actually calculated these manifolds using these very sophisticated mathematical techniques due to Kroskoff and Singa. And England, these are called the search circle method and the growing method. Um, you can uh, look in his paper if you're more interested in those kinds of ideas. Uh, finally, I just want to show you about this direction of entrainment. So now let's look at two different iterates, starting one just to the left of the stable manifold of point C. Um, and you notice that in this particular example, the iterates move up through, I should have mentioned that the space space is a torus. I hope you all got it. Everything is wrapped around in both the X direction as well as the Y direction. Um, so in this particular example, the iterates move up through the boundary and come out in a phase advancing manner. So if I were to walk you through this, you would see that the red trajectory phase advances, um, sorry, excuse me, phase delaying, my mistake. It phase delays until it converges to the black solution. But if we start with a nearby iterate, but on the other side of the manifold, then the solution phase delays as I move up, but then it begins to phase advance. And this simulation shows that that's exactly what happens, okay? So I just wanna point out that the simulation is chosen by looking at the right initial condition that's suggested by the map, okay? We would have never found those initial conditions unless we had the map. So in conclusion, um, I hope that I've showed you, if not convinced you, that this two-dimensional map that Guang Yuan uh, has derived really does reveal some mathematical structure that you wouldn't know existed if you just did simulations. And um, the main point is that 
the saddle points and the manifolds of that map, even though they're a map, okay, we know in maps things can jump around. They don't need, you know, they can cross over manifolds because they can, the iterate can jump over a manifold. If you're on the manifold, you stay on it, but you can jump over one. But even though that's the case and this is a map, the manifolds really do seem to organize the behavior of the flow. Uh, though I didn't discuss it here, we can use these entrainment time plots to calculate jet lag for various scenarios. Uh, Casey and I have a paper in uh, the Journal of Theoretical Biology, in case you're interested in that. Um, this map that we've derived is not unique to the Novak Tyson model. We can use it for just about any uh, circadian oscillator. There's a big caveat, which is something that I'll get to at the bottom. But we can, we can use this idea for just about anything. Um, now, just because I'm in a stochastic session, I have to at least have one bullet point to say my claim, which I'm not 100% sure of, but I, there's experts on the panel and in the room. I do believe that this idea should be applicable even when your oscillator, circadian oscillator, has some amount of stochasticity. Maybe there's some stochasticity or noise in the way that the light dark cycle enters. Maybe there's stochasticity or noise in the way that the coupling functions work. But I go back to, let me just go back here for the, for the uh, dynamicists in the room. This is a transverse intersection. This is a transverse intersection. I don't think noise, small amount of noise or small amount of stochasticity is gonna break that transverse intersection. So I do believe we would be able to extend these ideas to uh, uh, that scenario. Now the, the drawbacks of the map is that they don't really give us existence of periodic orbits. We just know that uh, they suggest the existence of the periodic orbits for the flow. And we really do have to be looking at a neighborhood of the entrained solution in order to construct the map. We don't have information about the full phase space through this technique. These are shortcomings of the approach, which I'd like to acknowledge. But uh, thank you for uh, listening, and I'm happy to take any questions in the remaining time. Okay, thank you very much, Amit. That was fascinating. Um, there's probably time for uh, one question before we transition to Dan's talk. Um, would anybody like to put a question up or raise your hand? I can call on whoever's got a question. If not, um, I'll ask a question. Oh, so sure. you showed in the data um, slide from Lisa and Siegelman, yeah. uh, the, uh, the, the switching of the, the phase of these different component oscillators um, is is crossing over the um, so one oscillator lapping another is that what makes you feel lousy when you're jet lagged like can you correlate the, the degree of discomfort somehow with the phase uh, the lack of phase coherence um, I, that that's a great question Peter and I, I think you know uh, again empirically and kind of qualitatively the answer to that is yes I mean lots of times we associate jet lag simply with being tired right so I went to a new uh, location and I felt tired, therefore I felt bad. But it's not necessarily that you're feeling tired, it's this maybe, you know, you're used to eating at a certain amount of time, at a certain time, relative to your old time zone. Now you're in a new time zone, you've suddenly introduced not just a shift in light dark, but a shift in when you introduce food into your system. And that can, your body's not ready for it at that point. So that's going to cause a, a basically some sort of negative feeling. So it's it's probably a combination of all of these different peripheral oscillators leading in some way to a, to what we would call jet lag. It's not just sleep. Right. It's not very, very interesting. Yeah. Um, I think we need to leave it there. Okay. Can Thank you, you can you go into the control panel as the host yep. and make Dan Wilson the host? Yep. Dan, there you go. And Dan is going to tell us about phase reduced models beyond weak perturbations. Okay, let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, good. That, that good? Okay. Um, well, thank you for all in attendance, and thanks especially to James and Peter for, for handling the transition from, uh, the, on, from the in person conference to online. Uh, I'm Dan Wilson at the University of Tennessee. Um, let's see. Okay. So the motivation for this talk uh, comes from our trying to come up with good reduced order modeling techniques for oscillatory dynamical systems, especially when we want to think about large magnitude inputs 
there's a lot of applications where we have oscillations like in neurological rhythms, uh, circadian cycles like Amit just talked about, uh, heart rhythms, or usually what you're really interested in uh, are heart arrhythmias, which can be viewed uh, in, a, in a periodic manner. Things like supersonic fluid flow, you can get uh, oscillations emerging under certain circumstances. And just to give you a visual picture, this is uh, simulated data from a noisy neuron. It has spikes that come in with almost the same period, although it's not always the same due to noise. And this is sort of the, the kind of system uh, that we'd like to be able to represent with reduced order modeling techniques. So around, uh, as we've seen in many, many talks, uh, when people think about reducing oscillatory dynamical systems, Oftentimes they rely on the notion of asymptotic phase, uh, which is defined by the isochronous birth system. So in, what I'm showing here is a two-dimensional version of the Hodgkin-Huxley equation. Uh, here's uh, for this parameter set a periodic orbit in gray. Uh, so to define phase, you can set a, a variable theta from zero to two pi on the limit cycle. And you scale it so that d theta dt is equal to omega in the absence of input. And then you can extend the notion of phase to the basin of attraction of the limit cycle using isochrons, which essentially say that two initial conditions are on the same isochron if, as you integrate the dynamics forward in time, they end up in the same spot. So that's what this equation is saying here. So for the, this Hodgkin-Huxley model, I'm uh, computing all the isochrons for the system numerically. And we see that two initial conditions that start on the same isochron as we integrate forward in time, they ultimately come together. They happen pretty fast in this model. And then they get to the periodic orbit at about the same spot, and then they stay there forever. So that's, uh, that's how you define isochrons. So once you have isochrons for an arbitrary dimensional system, you can do a phase reduction, which is essentially just a, a linearization uh, in the isochrons about the periodic orbit. So in this case, you say, well, in the absence of any input, d theta dt is equal to omega, uh, just like you defined it a uh, slide earlier over here. And then if you want to understand how input affects the phase, you take the phase response curve, which is just the gradient of the isochrons with, re with respect to the state, uh, multiplied by the input itself, or dot product with the input itself. And what you get here is sort of a, a very limited view of what's going on in the system, which is okay. Uh, if you give small magnitude inputs, you'll probably stay pretty close to the periodic orbit. And so that linearization in the isochrons is probably going to be okay uh, in terms of understanding what the dynamics are. But if you get pushed out here, or you get pushed out here, really you don't know quite what's going on uh, because you've lost that information, the linearization, compared to this full picture you had uh, in the unreduced system of equations. So the question becomes, uh, how can we uh, extend the notion of phase reduction to handle larger inputs uh, still in a reduced coordinate framework? So if we get pushed out here, pushed out here, how can we figure out uh, what's going on? And uh, the other question that I'll talk about near the end is sort of, uh, you know, who cares? You know, wh what can we do this with this extra information because uh, phase reduction works so good anyway? I had to spend a lot of time convincing uh, my postdoctoral advisor, Bart Ehrmantraut, uh, of this second one. And so hopefully I can convince you guys too. Um, so here's, uh, here's some preliminaries, uh, really definitions. We have uh, dx dt is our system that we're thinking about is equal to f of x, just some unperturbed dynamical system. Uh, x is in Rn and, and really I'd like to think about large dimensional systems or design strategies that work when you have really large dimension, although I'll talk mostly about smaller dimensional systems here today. Uh, assume we have a periodic orbit, x gamma of t in the absence of input, and, a, and we'll call the deviation from the periodic orbit uh, to be equal to x minus x gamma of t, or delta x. So if we want to know what's going on far from the periodic orbit, we need some uh, understanding of the amplitude coordinates for that periodic orbit. And there's a lot of people uh, who have been work recently for looking at the amplitude coordinates of uh, a periodic orbit. The coordinate system I'm going to use uh, is the isostable coordinate framework, which is sort of kind of like Floquet theory. Um, and they can also, you can also think a bit about uh, level sets of Koopman eigenfunctions, but I think most people are probably familiar with Floquet theory, so that's what I'll explain the gist of it. 
uh, with today. So suppose if you're thinking about Floquet theory, you're looking at the deviation from the periodic orbit, you can write that as uh, x gamma theta, uh, so whatever it is on the periodic orbit itself, plus a linear combination of these floquet eigenfunctions, gj, multiplied by these isostable coordinates. And if you assume that these isostable coordinates are small in magnitude, this representation is accurate. Uh, assume the isostable coordinates are order epsilon. This representation is accurate to order epsilon squared. And so if, if you do it just like this, sometimes people call these floquet coordinates. Uh, it turns out that, you, uh, or I guess one well, thing I'll say first, is we're going to truncate some of the rapidly decaying isostable coordinates. So all these isostable coordinates are going to have some decay rate. We'll assume that if they decay really fast, we're just not going to care about them, that they're probably going to be close to zero anyway, and so that's how we get the reduction here. And it turns out using um, ideas from Koopman operator theory, uh, well, sometimes you don't even need Koopman operator theory to define isostable coordinates explicitly, but oftentimes uh, you need to define them implicitly as level sets of Koopman eigenfunctions. But in any case, you can extend this idea to the base of attraction of the limit cycle, and you can get a, a coordinate framework with unperturbed dynamics that evolve uh, very nicely like this, where your phase, just uh, d, d theta dt is equal to a constant omega, and your isostable coordinates all have this nice decay rate that's, uh, that decays according to the uh, floquet exponents here. And so these two properties are going to be really important in just a second. All right, so we want to figure out, again, what's going on far from the periodic orbit. And so we're going to expand delta x in a basis of these isostable coordinates and phase coordinates. So I can write this just with this Taylor expansion. Uh, here's my first order terms. These are just the same as the, the first order terms from here. And then I can take second order terms, which are two isostable coordinates multiplied together. And then I have these GJK uh, Floquet eigenfunctions for the second order. I can do this out to, to third order. So three isostable coordinates, third order Floquet eigenfunctions. I can go as far as I want. Uh, and I take all that information and I call that G of theta uh, and all of my isostable coordinates, psi 1 through psi m. And the trick here uh, is we want to be able to calculate gk, gjk, gijk, all of these uh, floquet eigenfunctions in order to uh, get a sense of what's going on, again, far from the periodic orbit. So how we're going to do this is, is a strategy that's, that's maybe a little bit similar to when you use the adjoint method. Uh, for computing phase response curves. It's just extended out to the higher orders of accuracy. So the first thing I can do is I can take the derivative of delta x with, with respect to time, and this is actually the easy part. Um, it's easy because of these properties here, where I, when I take my time derivatives, I get really simple dynamics. So if I take the product rule uh, of delta x, when I take the time derivative, I get these floquet exponents showing up here. Uh, this time derivative of my flow Kaiga function shows up here, and the same general pattern repeats the second, third, and higher order uh, expansions. So I've got two flow K exponents here, three flow K exponents here, et cetera. Uh, so that you can write it pretty, pretty easily. Um, you can go from a different perspective and look at what the delta x dt is if you know the function f of x, x itself. So uh, we'll take f sub j is equal to the jth component of this function f and expand in a basis of delta x. Uh, so we have all of these partial derivatives here. Um, and, and essentially, you know, this is, this is just all bookkeeping, honestly, at the end of the day. This is Kronecker product. This is vec, which, which takes a, a matrix and stacks the columns in, in, into a vector. And it's just, it's really bookkeeping so that I can essentially write a Taylor expansion in multi, multiple dimensions um, in a nice way. Uh, so these, these are all our partial derivatives and they're defined recursively, uh, just, just partial derivatives here. So you end up with something that we're probably familiar with. The delta x dt is equal to the Jacobian times delta x, that's the first order expansion. Uh, and then all this extra stuff is the higher order terms. Again, it's just a bunch of partial differential equations, uh, all, all written in, in such a way that I can write it in vector formats. Um, so we'll notice 
is that I have d delta x dt over here. I have d delta x dt from a completely different perspective. And I can set these two things equal to each other and match uh, powers of the isostable coefficients. And then I end up with these nice equations that tell me how to get my flow k eigenfunctions. Uh, so for instance, we end up with things, they have a really nice structure too, uh, which allows them to be computed in kind of this, this nice way on a computer uh, and not have to think too hard about it. Uh, so we get d i j k for, for the whatever eigenfunction you're thinking about is equal to when you go through and simplify everything. We have the Jacobian, we have subtractive primitives, all of these uh, Floquet exponents for whichever uh, i j k terms you have times the identity matrix. Take all that and multiply it by your Floquet eigenfunction themselves. And you get these extra terms over here that I'm calling periodic forcing. Uh, essentially, they're comprised potentially of everything that's a lower dimensional flow k eigenfunction. So for instance, if I'm going to third order terms, all I need is my up to second order terms and they all get lumped in here. And there is just basically a periodic forcing in this equation. So if I have my first order terms, I can get my second, second, I can get my third, third to fourth, and all the way as high as order as I want to go. Um, at a certain point, you run into limitations with numerical accuracy of double, double precision. Uh, but as we'll see, we can get pretty, pretty high up there uh, in some of the examples. Uh, and so for example, if you're trying to compute D, G, J, K, here's your Jacobian, here's kappa J times kappa, uh, kappa K, uh, G, J, K itself appears over here. And then here's my forcing terms. And again, as you see, uh, here's G, J, the first order term, G, K, first order term. Here's the Hessian. Uh, of, of F1, uh, the first component of uh, uh, F defined over here. Uh, and you can write it down like this. And then of course, we're thinking about periodic orbits. So the solution has gotta be periodic. And it turns out, unless, unless you have some sort of degeneracy in your isostable coordinates, there's gonna be only one periodic solution, at least to these equations. Uh, sometimes you have to deal with the possibility of multiple solutions. Uh, most of the time you don't, but even if you do have multiple solutions, you can figure out which is the right periodic solution to use. What I'll also say is that once you get to third order and fourth order, it gets really hard to write down what this periodic forcing term is. Uh, and so it's best to do it like, like on MATLAB or something. Um, if you're anything like me, I have difficulty even transcribing like 30 terms correctly without making a mistake. All of a sudden, if you're trying to do math and get the right terms, um, it doesn't work. But a computer is much better at that than me, so I, I use a computer to get these periodic forcing terms analytically. Um, so that's the G functions. You can extend this general idea. It's a little bit different, but the, the idea remains the same. To get z, which is the gradient of theta with respect to x, to get i, which is the gradient of the isostable coordinates with respect to x, the arbitrary order in the isostable coordinates, and you end up with equations that look like this. So this, again, looks a lot like the phase reduction. Uh, theta does equal to omega. Here's z of theta, all my isostable coordinates here. In this case, it's valid to or arbitrary order accuracy in my isostable coordinates. Same thing down here from my isostable coordinate equation. Um, again, ij is valid to arbitrary order accuracy, however far I want to compute it. And then x is equal to x gamma plus g, which is computed to high order. Uh, the details, if you're interested, are here, but um, there's, there's a lot of details and I'd, I'd, I'd probably spend the rest of the talk talking about them. So you can look, look in here if you're interested. Uh, so, just, so that's the, the what am I doing part of the talk. Uh, the who cares part of the talk is, is these couple examples. Um, so here's just a toy example where we're doing this. This is the non-radial isochrome clock. It's like the radial isochrome clock. Uh, you have a, a periodic orbit here at, uh, at a magnitude of one, uh, but except you get, uh, you go different speeds when you get off the periodic orbit. So that leads to the isochrons kind of swirling in towards the origin like this. So here's the dynamics and we'll, we'll use a, uh, an input in the X direction. You look at the ellipse that comes in here. So just again, for this toy example, we'll do this uh, transformation to isostable and phase coordinates. 
and uh, we get results that, that are pretty good. Uh, so I'm using a, a really large magnitude input here, 25 times sine of 2 pi t over 1.6. Um, so it, it's pretty large here, and then I'm uh, taking the models that I get and taking a look at what is the uh, ultimate behavior is after all the transients have died out. So here's uh, the periodic orbit. The black line that you can kind of see here is the actual system dynamics. Uh, this, this blue here is just the phase reduction, just the standard first order phase reduction. I couldn't even fit it on the same uh, axis, so I had to draw another one. So it, it really is not doing very good there. Um, but then, you know, as you go to higher order, sixth order gets better, eighth order gets better, 14th order, uh, you're pretty close. And then by the time I got past 14th, as I mentioned, I started getting um, some issues with, with floating point precision accuracy. So the results I was getting didn't, didn't work so well, but the 14th is still pretty high. Um, so that's just one example. This isn't a reduction because I've traded X and Y coordinates for theta and psi coordinates. Uh, I just wanna point that out. However, uh, just, um, just uh, it, it's kind of a, it, it tells you that this strategy works pretty well. Uh, so we'll try some maybe more complicated examples here. Uh, in this case, I'm going to think about uh, non-feedback control of stability. Uh, so the idea here is, you know, maybe you have periodic orbit, and maybe you'd like to change the stability of that periodic orbit. This is related to, in some sense, some of the early stuff that Ed Ott and collaborators did with things like OGY method, trying to stabilize perhaps an unstable periodic orbit or destabilize a stable periodic orbit. Um, we're going to take Z and I to first order accuracy in the eyes of stable coordinates. Uh, we're going to suppose that we're just giving a TP periodic input, and the reason for that is maybe we don't want to uh, we don't want to use any sort of feedback because maybe it's hard to do. Uh, maybe we just want to do open loop control or something. And then we take our equations. We're going to work in a rotating reference frame and we end up with the following here. So psi dot that uh, stays in the rotating reference frame is equal to delta omega. The difference between the nominal period uh, or the nominal frequency and the uh, frequency of our input. We have our first order term Z. We have a combination of the second order term, which I'm calling BK here. Same thing for our ISO stable coordinates, this uh, Foucault exponent, first order terms, second order terms. And what you'll notice is that this is periodic in time, so I can do some averaging to analyze uh, to see maybe how can I uh, change the stability of a periodic orbit. So that's what I'm doing here. I get all these sorts of terms um, from all of these equations here, but the ones I want to focus on or this a plus e phi. So y here uh, is a vector of all my isostable coordinates. Nominally, in the absence of input, we just have the k that's associated with the uh, sine of the flow k exponent. But then if I add input, uh, I can take you know, all of this information, do the averaging, and I get uh, this equation e of phi here, which again relates to uh, the c, j, k, functions over here. So the second order corrections to the isostable coordinates. And if I want to change the stability of one of these periodic orbits, remembering that once I average, uh, periodic orbits become fixed points with the same stability, then what I can perhaps do is try to design this E matrix such that the, uh, the eigenvalues of this A plus E change in some desirable way, either from positive to negative, if I want to stabilize, or negative to positive, if I want to destabilize. If I view this E as a perturbation, because A is so simple, it's just diagonal, all I really have to do is think about these terms on the diagonal of E in order to change those eigenvalues. Uh, so I can do that, and I can design optimal stimuli to change the stability uh, in a targeted fashion of uh, a Floquet exponent. Uh, so that's the gist of the idea. And it turns out this works pretty well um, for, for more complicated systems. Uh, so for instance, if I have 10 synaptically coupled neurons in this example, uh, they're all identical. And so we have all of these configurations for the periodic orbits. We have a splay state, we have block rotating states, we have synchronized states. 
Uh, only one of these, the stable state, is uh, the, the um, synchronized state is stable. You know, the principal Floquet multiplier is negative. All these other ones have positive principal Floquet multiplier, so they're unstable, but, but they exist. Uh, and perhaps maybe we'd like to change the stability of the, the stable synchronized states for something that's maybe a splay or rotating block or whatever. This is often what people think about when, when they're looking at deep brain stimulation for treatments for things like Parkinson's disease. Uh, typically they think, well, maybe there's too much synchrony, so maybe if we desynchronize, that would be good. That's especially what Peter Tass uh, thinks. Um, other people have different opinions, but anyway, that's the, uh, that's the idea here. Change the stable to an unstable. So we can use this strategy. We can design optimal stimuli that simultaneously destabilize a synchronized state and stabilize a nominally unstable antisynchronous state. So that's what I'm showing down here in the bottom left. Uh, we have some input that's designed just to barely change the stability so the flow K multipliers are close to zero. Uh, but we can solve those equations using the uh, sort of strategy I talked about a few slides ago. We get this input. And if you just barely destabilize it, what's generally going to happen is sometimes you'll end up at, a, at an anisynchronous state, but usually what will happen is you'll kind of wrap around because this is too high periodic and end up at a different uh, synchronized state. But if you increase the magnitude of your target locate exponents, giving a bigger input, then more of those initial conditions end up uh, in an anti-synchronous state. Uh, this sort of idea applies, uh, or you can apply it to larger populations of neurons. This is, I think, about 10 or 1,000 neurons here, designing inputs that are going to stabilize the, the three block, four block, five block, six block state with different target Floquet exponents. The, the three block one works pretty good uh, for most, of, so that's this stimulus. Uh, if you start off uh, with a synchronized state, they end up pretty nicely desynchronized into blocks. Four, five, and six don't work very well here. I should, I should mention that there's some noise in the system. Um, that four, five, and six, they work okay, but not quite as good uh, when you look at the order parameter RSS of here, uh, which is shown here, um, for reasons described in, in this reference here. Uh, but in any case, it, it works pretty good, especially for splitting things up in three blocks. Just briefly, um, here's another example uh, where we're looking at two, uh, two coupled, synaptically coupled neurons, uh, capacitance-based neurons. And if you just do standard techniques that involve first-order phase reduction, uh, you end up with coupling functions if you go through all your averaging and all of your uh, change of basis. Your coupling functions, the shape is not going to depend on the magnitude of your input. Uh, the, the magnitude of the function will depend on the, the magnitude of the, of the coupling, uh, but the shape itself won't change. But now all of a sudden, if you incorporate these second order uh, corrections, you can get the shape changing. So that's what I'm showing here in the panel to B and D. The lower magnitude input taking a second order approximation, we end up with this uh, stable fixed point that's going to give us up here uh, some stable synchronization in the behavior of the coupled neurons uh, at about zero, so uh, completely in phase. If you start to increase the magnitude of that coupling, this portion over here unravels, and now all of a sudden we don't have these fixed points, and this disappears, uh, which is kind of counterintuitive as you increase the coupling. Uh, you lose stability of the synchronized state in favor of an anti-synchronous state. So um, that's just briefly I'll talk about uh, Youngman Park, who's one of Bard's former postdocs, is looking at trying to extend this to, to third, fourth, and fifth order accuracy. Uh, and he's got some, some cool results of that, which will hopefully um, sort of get, get out there soon. Um, in any case, uh, so we have some conclusions here. Uh, so really the, the gist of what I'm, what I'm talking about today is that standard phase reduction works great, uh, but sometimes it doesn't, especially when you use large magnitude inputs. Uh, so you can ex 
extends the notion of a phase reduction augmenting by these isostable amplitude coordinates calculate the necessary equations from uh, things that look like an adjoint equation in order to calculate what those reduced order equations should be. And oftentimes the resulting equations are analytically tractable so you can say interesting things about the underlying dynamic. Uh, and, and so one thing I'll mention is that in all the applications I've looked at today, I assumed that the underlying equations were known uh, in order to compute these things. And in real life, usually that's not true. Uh, and so one thing I've been thinking a lot about uh, recently is trying to estimate these uh, reduced order equations using purely data-driven techniques, assuming that you don't have the equations in front of you. Uh, here's a few references about stuff I've talked today and acknowledgments, uh, and I'd be happy to answer any, any questions. Thank you, Dan, that was, that was great. Um, we do have time for a question or two before we turn things over to Shusan. Um, so would anybody from oh, the participants I think my, like to my, ask my volume is actually not coming through at the moment. I can't, uh, maybe, uh, shoot, this happens sometimes on Zoom. Um, maybe I'll, I'll try to rejoin just a second. That usually fixes it. Okay, so if he left, then who's the host now? I guess he was the host before. Maybe I am. Oh, it reverted to me. Okay, great. <laughs> How about that? Um, so I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, make Shu send the host because he's going to give the next talk. Um, if Dan manages to rejoin us with his audio on, I think he couldn't hear our questions, so. Okay, Shusen, you are the host now. Hey, morning everyone. Uh, we're gonna wait uh, to get started until 11.30 in case Dan uh, manages to come to get back on sure. and take questions. I suppose people can think about their, think about their questions. Or people can ask the panel questions we just won't be able to answer them. Okay, I'm back, but maybe my uh, my time for questions is up. <laughs> uh, we we could we could take we could take one question. Sure. Um, if there's one, I'm looking at the um, chat. Peter, I can ask one. Yes. Oh, go ahead. So Dan, that was a great talk. Thanks. Um, the the control strategies for moving um, solutions from one stable from the stable to a say a new stable originally unstable uh -huh. are those easy to define like is it easy to come up with the strategy or yeah that so that's that's a that's a really good question and i glossed over a lot of that um but uh so so part of it is changing the stability of those uh of those flow k exponents uh, another part of it is making sure that um, you end up with with something where the phase uh, gives you a, a location that's that's stable uh, when you do the, the averaging, uh, and there are a few other um, considerations that I talked about in that it was a journal math biology paper. Uh, but uh, essentially, it, it turns out that that there's not as many um, considerations or there's not as many conditions as you would expect, and some things turn out to cancel out uh, if you delve into uh, the actual dynamics, especially when everything is uh, identical or you have identical oscillators. Things get, get easier um, to, to do. So, but, but that's a good question that, that again, I glossed over, but, but uh, it, it turns out to not be too onerous. Okay, great. Thanks, Dan. Yep. Perfect. Okay. So, um, our last talk will be by uh, Xu Sen Pu, who is a PhD candidate at Case Western Reserve University and my student. And he's gonna talk about uh, using some of these uh, stochastic phase methods to estimate interspike intervals.
Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes, looks good. Okay. Um, in today and yesterday talk, we have seen a lot of definitions uh, and variations of base response curve. Uh, today, I'm going to uh, talk about how can we use the mean return time of phase response curve to quantify the contributions of ion channel transitions to the interspec interval variability in stochastic pattern actually models. Uh, it sounds very long, but I will show you uh, how do we do it and what do we mean exactly. This work uh, is joint work with uh, Dr. Peter Thomas at Case Western University, and the data recordings are coming from uh, Dr. Deborah Frey's lab at Case School of Medicine. Um, first of all, I would, uh, would like to show you an example of stochastic oscillator on the left. It's a spontaneous activity of intact Purkinje cells. Purkinje cells, which is one of the uh, largest neurons in the brain. Um, on the y-axis, we are plotting the, the membrane potential, the x-axis across the time. As we can see that uh, the Purkinje cells is spontaneous firing. If we uh, find if we find the diff the time difference between the consecutive spikes, which we call interspike intervals, uh, plot and plot the histogram of interspike intervals on the right corner, we can see that the interspike interval uh, is concentrated around six, uh, sixteen milliseconds. However, it's ranging from roughly from twelve milliseconds to twenty-two milliseconds. So there's a variability of the interspike interval. On the red panel is a molecular level insight of neuron spiking. Um, probably everybody here is familiar with uh, action potential. I just want to refresh your mind that uh, when the uh, cell uh, receives a stimuli and across a threshold, a lot of um, sodium channels open, uh, which pumps in the sodium ions into the cell, uh, which depolarize uh, member potential uh, in the um, red. And uh, uh, in the rising in the rising phase, and in uh, after um, rapid rise, the membrane potential uh, rapidly falls. Uh, in the falling phase, uh, the sodium channel closes and potassium channel opens. So that's um, our approximate part of the process of action potential. So on the left is what we can observe experimentally. On the right hand side, that's the insights of the molecular label. Uh, of uh, action potentials. So the first question uh, one would uh, like one would ask is that what are the molecular sources uh, for the macroscopic variation in neuron times and uh, spike in timing? And so uh, is that the sodium gain channels or potassium channels, uh, or is that a combination of them? Um, so this question has been answered in the last century. Uh, the first mathematical model, or the one of the most um, uh, important mathematical, which was regarded as one of the most important mathematical models in the last century, uh, was proposed by Hutchinson and Huxley in 1952. Um, again, everybody should be um, familiar with this model already. Um, it's a full set of uh, nonlinear differential equations. Uh, the first one is dealing with uh, current uh, through the membrane, which consists of sodium current, uh, a potassium current, and a leak current. Those G and A, G, K are the maximum conductances for sodium and potassium channels. Uh, and those M, H, and N are non-dimensionalized uh, gating variables ranging from zero to one. They can either be in its uh, closed state uh, or in its open state with open probability of alphas and uh, closed probability of betas. Those open and closed uh, rates depends on the membrane potential, on the voltage. Um, the Hutch Huxley, the orange Hutch Huxley model is just uh, um, four um, nonlinear ordinary differential equations. So if we select a set of parameters, um, the Hutch Huxley model will generate regular spikes with uh, perfect period. Uh, uh, but, it, but this system also gives rise to uh, uh, underlying stochastic kinetics Taking the uh, potassium channels, for, uh, for example, we have four identical copies of the N gates. Uh, each of them can either be in its uh, closed state or in its open state. So that uh, we have, because we have four N gates, so that we will have five different configurations. And zero is corresponding to that. Zero of the N gates is open, and one means that one of them is open, and then four means that four of them are open. Here I'm plotting for both gates, the potassium and sodium gates. The uh, green circle, the circles marked with green um, is the conducting state. 
So the potassium, uh, potassium channel is conducting only when it's in the uh, conduction state. Uh, in this case, um, only when the four potassium gates are in its open state. For, uh, for example, at one time, if one potassium channel is sitting at N3 with two of the N gates being open, so for the uh, uh, shortcoming future, it might stay uh, in that state and uh, N3 or uh, open either one of those closed states with probability to alpha and move to N3 or um, close one of these open um, gates to uh, N2. So, um, sorry. So um, now that we have the underlying kinetics uh, for the ion channel kinetics, uh, they'll have the random change between those uh, different states, which we call uh, channel noise. On the left-hand side is what we can observe uh, from experimental recordings. Uh, what we can observe is only the membrane potential. So we see the variations in the membrane potential, and we know that um, there's a mathematical model or underlying kinetics, uh, which is a Markov, Markov jumping process. So how do those different um, molecular levels of variability impact those microscopic variations that we can observe? That's the main question I would like to address in today's talk. Before showing you the results of these uh, uh, two questions, answer to question two, I would like to introduce uh, you a uh, fast and efficient simulation methods for stochastic Hodgkinson model. Um, the, the a discrete channel noise model uh, here, uh, which uh, for, for the potassium case, um, for example, can be implemented using discrete uh, approximations or continuous time hybrid Markov models. Uh, under current clamp, uh, the current, uh, under voltage clamp, the voltage is holding as a constant uh, so that those transition rates, alphas and betas, are just constant which reduces the system to a time, uh, time homogeneous Markov chain, uh, which can be simulated use, using stand, uh, standard methods such as the Gillespie's. Even with the Gillespie's algorithm, uh, such Markov chain algorithm are uh, numerically expensive to simulate it with a large number of channels, for example, thousands or tens of thousands of uh, channels. So there is, a, um, there is an ongoing demand for efficient methods. The first efficient methods I've like to mention today is uh, non-joint equations. In 1994, Fox and Lu observed that to every focal plank description, there is associated a non-joint description where they proposed uh, a non-joint description as follows. Um, those M8 uh, represents for the, the opening fraction of the sodium channel and five is the opening fraction uh, of uh, the potassium channel. For example, that's uh, a number of uh, particles, number of uh, potassium channels being at the state N4 divided by the total number of potassium channels. Those M and N gates uh, here, there's M and N gates uh, are vectors uh, consisting of those fractions being at uh, the sodium gates and uh, fractions being at those uh, potassium gates. And those noise terms are similar with what uh, we have seen today and yesterday. Uh, to look at the details of those um, uh, non-joint model, we can uh, they construct those uh, rate matrix, which is the mean field uh, corresponding to the transitions between each state from, um, for example, uh, the four alpha n times n zero goes to n one, so that's uh, the negative sign there, and it moves to n one, so you can construct the uh, read matrix easily from the uh, transition diagram like that. Uh, the S matrix, however, uh, depends on a diffusion matrix defined um, also on the transition graph, where each pair of uh, those transitions are uh, located on the off di diagram matrix. For example, uh, the interaction between the first and the second component uh, is located in uh, the entry 1, 2, and 2, 1, 2, 1, 1, 2. Uh, where it's four alpha n times n zero uh, and uh, beta n times n one. That's those um, entries. In um, this uh, implement uh, those methods uh, improves the computational efficiency compared to the uh, Markov model. However, in each time, if we want to simulate this method, we need to take square take a square root of this five by five uh, DK matrix uh, for potassium channel 
And for the sodium channel, we needed to take a square root of eight by eight matrix in each time step, which is real time consuming. And so in order to improve this method in the paper we wrote earlier this year, uh, we proposed a 14 by 28D non model uh, where um, we have the same AQ matrix, uh, uh, the reach matrix. Um, for the diffusion matrix, uh, the SK here, we can construct, we construct the SQ matrix uh, directly from the transition graph by uh, reserve, preserving each direct edge in the channel transition graph here um, as an independent row source. For example, the first column is corresponding to the first transition uh, in the transition diagram, which is four R for N times N zero. Uh, that moves from uh, the first state to the second state. So we can read off the uh, S matrix directly um, so we don't need to take square root anymore in this case, which dramatically improves the uh, computational efficiency. This method compared with, uh, combined with another uh, efficient method, which is called a stack as shielding, I'm going to show you in the next slide, uh, will significantly uh, improve the computational efficiency. The idea of stack as shielding method is to approximate the underlying Markovchin model uh, with only a subset of transitions, for example, uh, we we'll take the potassium again. Um, he, instead of using all those eight transitions, we can take um, those two transitions uh, associated to the open state. Um, so in that case, um, the SK matrix do not need to have those. Um, so we eliminate those first uh, six entries um, and set them to be zeros. Uh, those two entries uh, would be uh, the last two con corresponding to the last two transitions. So by using stack, applying stack as shielding uh, with the efficient methods we proposed uh, for the 14 times 20 entity, we don't need to take a square root anymore. And also we reduce uh, the noise dimension dramatically. Uh, here is a comparison between the 14 times 20 entity model uh, and the stochastic model, uh, along with uh, several models proposed in literature. Uh, as we can see that those blue ones uh, gave pretty much similar uh, results uh, what I'm comparing here is not the first or second moment of uh, introspective interval, but the whole uh, distributions. Uh, so that's L1 difference between the cumulative density function of uh, introspective intervals. Each simulation contains roughly five times 10 to the nine introspective intervals. Um, as we can see that uh, those three ones have similar performance. Actually, in the paper, we proved that uh, if we use the same boundary conditions, those three class of models would be um, pathwise equivalent. By saying quad pathwise equivalent, uh, we mean that uh, if you have one sample trajectory for box and loose model, you can transfer that, that trajectory into a surgery model. Uh, the stochastic shielding was method, um, though uh, even though it's not as perfect as those three cross uh, um, equivalent models, but it still gives a pretty good uh, approximation to the Markovian model. So, uh, and the computational efficiency, the runtime uh, for, so the runtime is recorded for the uh, same length of uh, simulation and on the same machine. And you can see that it's uh, significantly faster. There's also another fast method proposed by Fox and Rudy 97, uh, but the accuracy is poor. Uh, here is just another way to realize the results uh, on the x-axis and um, plotting the computational efficiency of different methods uh, compared to the Markov chain model. Uh, on the y-axis is uh, the L1 difference of the cumulative density functions versus the Markov chain model. So, uh, the best mo the, so we want to select those models close to the orange as, uh, as close as possible. As we can see that those uh, two blue ones uh, the world sutures model and the 14 d 14 times 28 d model uh, gives the best accuracy uh, with the best efficiency. Uh, if we are willing to sacrifice a little bit of the um, accuracy, uh, the, we can use the stochastic shielding method, uh, which dramatically improve uh, the computational efficiency. Uh, now that we have a non model to um, model those underlying Merkle chain models, and also uh, we have fast and accurate simulation methods. Uh, now we are ready to introduce um, the uh, underlying contribution, the contributions from the underlying changes, uh, transitions to the overall ability. 
Um, before showing the term, I would like to uh, review uh, the definition of the non-joint equations again, uh, where we introduce a uh, scaling factor epsilon in front of those uh, G matrix. Well, G matrix here is just a combination of the S N and S K we proposed before. Uh, we write it concisely here. Uh, on the left panel is a cartoon of the isophase sections, uh, which we also call S-crons for the stochastic trajectory. Uh, it has been proved and shown in the previous talks that uh, it's well-defined uh, the mean return time from uh, one point on the um, isophase section um, after one full sec um, oscillation back to itself uh, equals to the mean um, period T epsilon. So we define the crossing time, um, the sequence of cross time to the isophase section as mu k. The isophase interval is defined as the time difference between consecutive, uh, consecutive um, crossing times. And based on those isophase intervals, we can define its uh, mean and variance. So here we go. That's the answer we found for the uh, question two. So by considering the backward equation, or sometimes we call it adjoint focal practical equation of the isophase intervals, we proved that for in the small noise region, the contributions of individual transitions, the contributions of individual transitions in this um, uh, transition, di transition diagram um, um, decompose linearly to uh, those uh, different edges. Uh, so the, in other words, the variance of isophase interval can be decomposed linearly into a summation of uh, those uh, contributions from different uh, edges. In this case, we have 28 edges, so we have 28 different sources of contributions. And those 28 different contributions can be uh, written uh, explicitly in this way, uh, where it's epsilon, uh, the scaling factor, times uh, the integral from zero to the mean period. Um, in the integral sign, that's a flux around a case edge. So in this case, it's uh, M5 times uh, 3M uh, alpha N here. Uh, so that's a flux on the case edge. And uh, at K here is a case uh, stoichiometry vector acting on the phase response curve. That's a phase response curve, uh, what we're talking about during the last few days. So and it squares that one. So if we use the stochiometry vector acting on the uh, phase response mass curve, it can be regarded as the equivalent phase response curve associated to the case trans trans transition or the case edge. So basically, the contribution from the case edge to the inter in isophase interval, uh, the variance of the isophase interval, can be regarded as the integral uh, from zero to the mean period of the flux times its corresponding and phase response curve. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to show the details of the proof, uh, but I'll show some results. Uh, it's almost there for the uh, for answerable questions of the um, connections between the interspike interval, the variance of interspike interval, and those underlying transitions. Uh, but uh, here we are. Uh, the theorem is is regarding to the isophase interval. I'll show you the difference later. Uh, but uh, first of all, I would like to show you some of these uh, numerical results of the performance of the isophase, the variance of isophase interval and the predictions we have. Uh, those blue dots, those blue uh, curves are those predictions from the theorem. Uh, so the dot ones is using the exact uh, trees, exact trajectories of alphas and m's, um, so which is stochastic. Uh, the the blue, uh, blue solid line plots uh, the approximation from the Nibir cycle. So basically we use those variables from the Nibir cycle instead of using the real uh, realizations. And we can say that those, um, you know, in the small noise region, um, they have pretty good agreement uh, with, you know, either use the exact realization or use the Nibir cycle uh, prediction. Um, those uh, black circles uh, are those uh, realizations uh, for, for the variance of in aspect intervals. The x-axis plots a uh, trial number. So we have, in this plot, we have 1,000 repeated trials uh, of those uh, to calculate the isophase, in the variance of, of isophase intervals. For each of the trial, 
more than one thousand uh, interspec intervals are recorded. Uh, so in this case, we have more than one thousand across time of the isophase sections. Uh, the y-axis is uh, just the, uh, the variance, variance of isophase uh, intervals. So the mean plus um, minus standard deviation divided by the number of simulations is plotted in black bar here. As we can see that uh, we have a pretty good agreement from the theory, uh, that's uh, blue ones and the black ones. But it, however, um, that's not the end of the story yet. Um, there are another way to, so um, in this talk, we have introduced two ways of defining the uh, variability. One way is to define the variability using the isophase interval, uh, which, we pr which we proved uh, in a term and show that it, it has good, uh, pretty good match. Uh, and here is what we have in the real data. So in the real life case, we don't know, um, uh, we don't have any information about the gating variables. Uh, the only thing we have is uh, um, voltage recorded or memory potential. So on the left is uh, memory potential. So given, uh, given uh, a voltage trace, we can set up a threshold, voltage threshold to, for example, negative 20 on the right hand face, negative 20 millivolts on the right hand face, we can count uh, those interspec intervals and find those interspec, uh, the interspec intervals uh, to find the statistics, statistics to the same analysis we did uh, in the last slide. Uh, we can see that uh, even though uh, it's the, the variance of interspec interval uh, stays close to the predicted values, but it's off a little bit. Um, those um, discrepancy between the prediction value, uh, the blue ones and the red uh, triangle ones is the mean of the um, variance of interspec intervals, it's, it's roughly about three to 4%. Um, so this question puzzled me actually for a long time to, um, to think about this problem. So why does this dis discrepancy come? Uh, or uh, like, is that because we dropped some uh, second order term? Um, but if you look at those uh, discrepancies, it's uh, 10 to the negative four on the magnitude of 10 to negative four, and the noise is 10 to negative two. So uh, the discrepancy is within the range of um, epsilon square, but still we can see a clear discrepancy between those uh, values. So in order to, in, um, so by the time, by the process of investigating the um, wiring, the variance of interspec interval, I found that the variance of interspec interval actually depends on the voltage threshold you chose, uh, we chose. Um, in this plot, we are plotting um, the uh, variance of interspec interval, uh, both for real data and simulations. The first panel is coming from 14 uh, different wild type per kg cells. Uh, each of them uh, is scaled by the uh, value at negative 20 because uh, different uh, cells have different um, standard deviations. So uh, it's not easy to visualize them together at once. So I scaled them by the values where they become stable at negative 20. So uh, as we can see that in the real life uh, recordings, we have a clear transcend of those uh, variance of interspec intervals. It gradually increases until it reaches uh, a constant. Uh, and what those observation was also uh, discovered in the numeric simulations where uh, when the lowest level is around one, and you, which is close to the real life case, uh, we can uh, each, we can say that there's clear transcend of the interspec, uh, the standard deviation or the variance of interspec intervals, it gradually increases until it reaches um, uh, a steady state. And when in the smaller is return, we can calculate the approximately the isophase interval or the phase response curve so that uh, once we have the phase response curve, we can calculate the um, isophase and the variance of isophase intervals uh, where, where we put a, a sigma phi here. As we can see that the isophase interval remains a constant no matter uh, um, what, what, what the threshold we chose, but the uh, isophase interval increases uh, increases as the way increase the um, voltage threshold. And the discrepancy between them is exactly around three to four percent. Even though that the interspec, the uh, variance of interspec interval uh, has a discrepancy between the isophase, the variance of isophase interval, uh, it's not a constant. Um, it's still have a very good uh, um, approximation actually uh, on the um, 
in the next, next few slides, I'm going to show you uh, the performance of introspect interval using the term. Um, on the left panel is the uh, individual contributions from the eight uh, transition in the eight transitions in the potassium channel, uh, where each of them, uh, um, those each curve E1 means that only the first transition in the potassium channel is included, and we uh, put set walls the laws as uh, laws from other edges uh, to zeros using stochastic shielding, the ideas of stochastic shielding. So we block all the noise sources from um, the sodium and other case, other transitions from potassium. As we can see that the linear region stays for a long time. I didn't put the predicted value here because it would be look a little bit messy uh, on the left. But uh, on the right hand side, I'm plotting the um, predictive value uh, together with uh, numeric simulations. So the black curve is the exact um, variance of interspec intervals calculated using a voltage threshold at a negative 20 millivolts, uh, which, is, which is not uh, negative 55 or um, anything below negative 50. It's chosen the steady, uh, where it's become stable around negative 20. Uh, as we can see that in the lowest range, uh, when the lowest ranges from uh, eight to the negative six uh, to eight to the negative one, roughly eight to the negative point of one five, um, the prediction in blue uh, has a pretty good agreement with the black uh, curve, which is the SFS interval, the linear decomposition holds. And the similar results hold for the uh, sodium channels, uh, as we can see that uh, as we can see that those uh, linear region holds for uh, the epsilon ranges from eight to negative six until uh, sometimes, you know, for the small noise, uh, when the edge has small noise, it holds up to uh, epsilon equals two, uh, e, to the, uh, e to the power two. And here, uh, similar results was obtained, uh, the linear additivity holds up to e to the negative one. <laughs> Let me point out, we have just a couple minutes left. Okay. Um, and the and the, uh, stochastic also we um, plot the stochastic shielding overall methods uh, to the overall model, uh, where the um, red curve, the red dashed line plots um, the linear prediction uh, from the term um, applied on the variance of uh, interspec intervals. The black one is uh, interspec interval observed using a voltage threshold and negative, and negative 20. As we can see that it has a pretty good agreement on TO e to negative two, which, which is corresponding to uh, a membrane area of 700 uh, micro, um, uh, micrometer squares. So that ends the talk uh, in the presentation. Uh, we presented a new laundry model which combined uh, with stochastic shielding approximation can give a significant uh, faster and accurate uh, approximation to the um, Markovich model. Uh, we prove in theory and provide in numeric simulations that the variance of isophase interval decompose linearly into a sum of um, contributions from each edge, which answers our second question. Despite the variance of interspec intervals varies with the choice of voltage thresholds, the linear decomposition theorem works surprisingly well uh, for the um, interspec inter for the variability of interspec interval as well. In the future, we would like to extend the framework to system beyond hard Saxony models. Uh, also, uh, to say whether, um, as we observed, that the stochastic shielding methods works beyond the small OS region, uh, but the linear prediction just um, ends at you know. Um, it's confined in the small race region. We would like to say whether it's possible to calculate the uh, second order of phase response uh, curve to increase, uh, increase the accuracy of prediction and to say whether it's possible to extend the region of um, low, um, small race region. Um, that's the end of the talk. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, Great, welcome. thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, questions from the participants or panelists? Give a second. I, I have a question. Yeah, uh, so yeah. I'm a bit confused um, why you had to take a matrix square root for your Langevin approximation. Uh, here? Uh, earlier, actually. Uh, you no, about... Fox and Lou, the original Fox and Lou. Why, are, why, are, why do they take the square root? Uh, why do they take the square root of the uh, diffusion matrix? Yeah, because I thought with Langevin approximation, you can just sum over the 
you can just sum over the reaction channels, so you shouldn't need to take a matrix square root, I would have thought. Um, those diffusion matrix comes from the focal plank equation, where that is, uh, um, if you uh, write the non joint description like that, um, that D matrix, uh, so um, usually people use G, so that D matrix is GG transpose. Um, by, that, by the time Fox and Lu proposed uh, Fox and Lu's model, uh, the only thing they know is a focal plank equation. So they derive from the focal plank equation where they only have the information for the D matrix. They I have no idea. Yeah, they, they have no idea about this matrix well on underlying kinetics. I understand. So it's, it's coming from Markov chain model there, right? Because you're, you're taking, yeah. you know, right? Like it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've got yeah. like a fast, you've got, you've got many ion channels and it's like, a, it's like an average, right? It's like central limit theorem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah. I'll, I'll contact you off this, but I would have thought you could, I'll, I'll talk to you off this later. Sure. Yeah. sure. Okay. Um, we are, uh, we can have an open discussion at this point since it is uh, uh, noon on the East Coast of the US now. Uh, we are officially ending, but um, if there were questions, more questions for Shusen or questions uh, for Dan or Amit or James uh, from the previous talks, we can have an open discussion until the last panelist wants to go eat lunch. So fire away. I will ask Shusen a question. Uh, uh, it, it is striking that the variance of the interspike interval does not seem to be an invariant. Um, and I, I don't actually remember seeing that anywhere in the literature before. So in what you were showing, uh, the variance of the return times from isophase to isophase equaled the variance of the return time from spike to spike if you set the voltage threshold at just the right threshold for counting your spikes. Yes. The, actually, that voltage threshold is negative 55 millivolts, uh, which was always referred as uh, um, Threshold, a threshold cross and voltage in the literature. People always say that you know the uh, voltage threshold for the animal cells is around negative 55. I don't know whether it's a coincidence or that's just <laughs> determined by some way. Right. So maybe people should go back to uh, measuring their the inner spike intervals and cutting their their spikes um, uh, differently than what what they what they normally do, which is often you hear, choose the steepest part of the, the action potential to get the best timing precision. But in fact, it looks like the variance of the inner spike interval depends on where you set the, th the threshold. Okay, other questions? Um, I could ask a question. So, you know, in lots of the methods that we saw throughout the, the two days, the limit cycles that we were talking about weren't necessarily the spiky kind that you Shu said and talked about just now. You know, yours were really voltage spikes, which you know, in the deterministic cases, you know, leads us to singular perturbations, fast flow analysis. Right. So, is there anything that's? I mean, and you may have spoken about this, but I, I may not have gotten it. Is there anything that's fundamentally um, different about uh, having to deal with these? What I would call you know, different time scale types of systems versus the other things that we were looking at in some of the other talks. In terms of your methodology, I mean, do you, do you take into account <clears throat> the fact that you do have these disparate time scales? Is, there, is, that, a, is that a hindrance or is that an advantage to in your methodology? Discrete, uh, discrete time for the for system? No, no, not discrete, just the fact that you know, if, if you just think about an action potential, it, it kind of is slowly rising, then there's a very steep right. rise, and then there's a fall. Mm -hmm. That's like having two distinct time scales in your, right, right. In your dynamical system. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering whether the way that you think about this, is it helpful to have distinct time scales for these methods? Or is that a problem, having distinct time scales? Is it an added, added complication? I think that adds a complication since, um, you know, in the during the AHP, uh, we, you know, the, the cells during the, so for a spontaneous firing cell, um, the cell spends a longer time during the AHP, which will supposedly to have more uh, variation or variance. And, but, it, but, it, but it, you know, sometimes if you, during the recordings, you have the noise comes 
not only from those um, you know uh, underlying kinetics, it also comes from the recordings. I think the different time scales make it harder to record those uh, voltage traces. Uh, you know, we would have some noise data. Um, potentially you have some more noise data. If you have one time scale, uh, it might be easier to record, to make a precise record where you, know, you can set up a, set up a, a criteria easily um, mm -hmm. with one standard. But if you have different time scales, it might be not so easy to uh, record the time. Actually, uh, one thing I'm thinking about uh, for the recordings we have, the, the time difference between record is 0 0.05 milliseconds. Uh, 0.05 milliseconds, but I don't know whether that's um, sufficiently small you know, enough uh, to capture all those uh, fluctuations, uh, but uh, um, that's worth uh, investigating, I think. Thanks. I'll ask a question of Dan, uh, Dan Wilson, if you're still there, Dan. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, in several of the other talks, people were, were and yesterday as well, people were addressing how to extend the um, phase reduction method just for isochrons to systems that are stochastic. And you mm -hmm. showed your first example, motivating example was uh, simulated data with a noisy neuron. And you mentioned that the oscillators you were looking at were stochastic uh, later on in your talk. Um, do you have any thoughts on extending the isostable coordinates to stochastic oscillators? Yeah, yeah, and you, you mentioned that. Yeah, I think you asked one of the one of the, the same questions. I did. I asked. I yeah. asked uh, <laughs> yesterday. I asked Maximilian the same question. So and, I guess you uh, could see it coming. And so, so that's a good question. Um, and I don't have a good answer for you. <laughs> that's uh, fair. I mean, it's yeah. maybe it's not a well posed question. I don't know. No, no, no. It, I, I I don't have. I don't know if I have any insight. Is what I mean. Um, you know, so so yeah, you have uh, if you're going to add some stochastic terms to that, you might be able to do some sort of Fokker-Planck formulation and, and think about things in terms of yeah, you know, maybe maybe average decay times. Um, but uh, probably, if I had to guess, what would probably happen is that you know think about some sort of probabilistic notion of what the amplitude coordinates are going to be, you probably end up with some sort of dif uh, partial differential equation. And you probably could analyze the, um, you know, slowly decaying components of that PDE in whatever framework that you're thinking about. Um, this is, this is really just spitballing off the top of my head. I mean, I, I but, but that might be uh, what you would do. All right. Yeah. Thanks. That's a that's a yeah. <laughs> fair question for a fair answer for an unfair question. <laughs> you could use um. I mean, just to be clear. You can write down the NATO formula for the SDE, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that would probably be the way to go, and then analyze um, you know sort of the, the the slowly decaying components of the spectrum of that of that uh, uh, formulation you know, to come yeah, up with yeah. isostable coordinates. But yeah, I think I think. Maximilian mentioned yesterday that that Koopman can do this, but I don't I don't think I'm not aware of any anybody who's used Koopman operator theory to do this before. So um, maybe it's out there, but but I'm not aware of that. Yeah, yeah, because I think Koopman's an average, right? I'm not sure I follow. Because if it's an average, it's going. I don't know how you write down an SD for that. Because SD has to be like a change of variable. Right, yeah. I, I think you'd actually probably have to analyze the SDE um, itself. Uh, but yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't, I you use, use Kubin on the, on the SDE, but not, not from one directly to the other. But again, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't know if I, I have super great insight into that question. Does anybody know if Igor Message might be looking at this? See if he's in the attendees. Well, I know he's not here. Many of you know him. So. Can, can I add a personal note? Yeah, go ahead. I'm looking for a postdoc position. So if any of, uh, of you are interested in hiring a postdoc, please let me know. <laughs> he's really good. He'd be a good hire. I can vouch for Shusun. Yeah. So. Thank you. It's a lousy time to be looking for a job in the middle of a pandemic yeah. with universities closing and, or well, no, not closing, but you know what I mean. So anyway, 
yeah, no funding, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good luck. Serious headwinds. Mm -hmm. Well, on that cheerful note, uh, okay. <laughs> if there aren't more questions, maybe we should adjourn, but we'll I pause a minute and see if anybody else has got a question. Thank you both Peter and uh, James for organizing the very nice session. Thanks, thanks for stepping in uh, on short oh, notice. I, I really no appreciate problem. you uh, doing that. No problem. Yeah, thank, thanks everyone. It was great. I enjoyed it. I learned a lot as well. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, I guess we'll close it. And it's going to go up on the internet, by the way, just warning you. It's going to go to the Life Sciences website. Great. Okay. Great. Yeah. Well, you uh, send everybody an announcement if you can once that's available. Sure. Yeah. I know some people couldn't attend who, who would have liked to. So. Sure. I'll do that. All right. Thanks a lot, everybody. Okay. Take care. Yeah. yeah. Stay Good safe. Yeah. Bye bye. Yeah. Okay. Bye. bye.